Happy Resurrection Sunday, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you all, welcoming you all to this first day of the week one more time. As we celebrate Easter Sunday, really every week, it is the only holiday that we as Christians celebrate every single week, we join with the rest of the world to recognize and announce and testify to this fact that Jesus was risen from the dead. Today we're going to go to an episode in Jesus' life where he's going to demonstrate to us what kind of a person he was, how social he was. We as human beings tend to often be very cliquish, and the definition of cliquish means to associate exclusively with the members of one's own clique or clan. Maybe it's due to insecurities, maybe to rivalries, maybe it's just a human social phenomenon. It certainly isn't, though, a spiritual trait, as we're going to see from Jesus. Jesus didn't model that in his interactions with people. We see him frequently interacting with people that he'd probably rather not interact with, like Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, scribes, tax collectors, prostitutes, and other sinners. He interacts with the common folk, with the fishermen, with the farmers. He interacted with the politicians of his day, with other religious leaders, and even pagan government officials. It seems like Jesus was not cliquish at all. We can't accuse him of that. Even among his inner circle of disciples, we don't see Jesus gathering unto himself people who maybe thought as he did or maybe liked the same things that he did. We don't see that at all. Matter of fact, the disciples were a motley crew of people from all kinds of political persuasions, national and ideological persuasions. That was a phenomenon that we can gather from his own disciples. We heard from Mike's lesson, Mike Chan's lesson a few Bible classes ago, uh, how Jesus was frequently invited to social gatherings and social events. We've even read so far of him going to a wedding, going to a dinner party, and now we're going to see him at a feast held in his honor by a recently made disciple of his. We're going to read about that in Luke, starting in verse 27 of chapter 5, where it reads, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in a tax office, and Jesus said to him, follow me. So Levi got up left everything, and followed him. This is occurring uh, after Jesus heals a paralytic. Remember the paralytic whose friends dug a hole in the roof so that they could lower him in front of Jesus? Well, this is happening right after that. And so he comes across Levi, whom we also know as Matthew. Same peep, same person, Levi, Matthew. He was a tax collector by trade. Let me tell you a little bit about tax collectors. They were the most hated of the socioeconomic classes amongst the Jews because they were seen by other Jews as betrayers of the people because they collected taxes and they collected it for Rome and the Jews did not have a good association with Rome. So they were seen as betrayers. Oh, you're working for the Roman people. You know, you're taking our money away and giving it to these pagan people. And they worked also for the state, for Herod at the time. Herod collected taxes, not just for himself and to keep the government going, but he also collected it for the Roman Empire. So oftentimes these tax collectors, they were not honest in their dealings with other people. You know, they had their little booths and their little offices. That's where probably Levi was sitting, collecting the taxes. I don't know how they enforced it or how they knew if you owed them or not, but maybe they had a ledger. And the thing that would happen is, okay, let me say I, I had the exact 10 denarii from my mother, from my brother, Mark Brazier. And I knew that's what he owed the government. But me being a tax collector, hey, I want to get rich off Mark because he's got a lot of money. So I'm going to charge him 20 denarii. And I'll keep 10 to myself and give the other 10 down the line. And that's how frequently tax collectors did. They, they bullied people. They stronged on people into collecting, over collecting the taxes. So Levi was this tax collector. So he probably didn't have other good relationships with his 
uh, people, with his brethren, the Jews. But right, right away, when Jesus calls him to, to follow him, look what it says here. He got up and he left everything. He left the office behind. He left the ledgers. He left it all. And he followed Jesus. It was kind of like when Jesus calls Peter and John, right? They left their fishing nets. They left their dad on the boat. They left the family business. And they went on and moved with Jesus. That shows us the, the kind of character these people were. Uh, and they knew something about Jesus already. It's not like they're getting up and, oh, who's Jesus? I don't know, but I'm going to follow him. It wasn't like that. They had been hearing of him for a while. Like the centurion. Remember the guy who said, oh, yeah, Jesus, you know, you have... You're, you're a man of authority. I know what authority is. Remember the guy who impressed Jesus? They had been hearing about this. So Levi was probably thinking a lot. And he had reached this critical juncture, this critical moment in his life where, what am I going to do? And now he sees Jesus. Jesus gives him the command. He says, you know what? It's time. And he left everything behind. Tax collectors were usually wealthy. And they were used to living quite comfortably. Remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, the little guy, he was a tax collector too. And he meets Jesus later on. We're probably going to go over his story. He was pretty wealthy. I mean, the challenge for him that day when Jesus called him to, to follow him or to have a feast in, in his house, he said, if I have cheated anybody, I'll pay them back seven times. Now, he should have been able to back that up. That means he had a lot of money. He was very wealthy. Think about this now. Think about the implications. How would you feel giving up on your wealthy and comfortable lifestyle to become a disciple of Jesus? That's the challenge Levi is facing at this point in time. Not only does it have personal implications for you, right? Not just what you're giving up for yourself, but think about your extended family. Think about how now that your socioeconomic status was going to change, how that was going to have its ripple effects down the line. They probably thought that you would be going off the deep end if you did something like that. Not to mention the political ramifications of you abandoning your tax post, the liability involved, because somebody, some official was going to say, uh, Levi, what, what did you do with all the taxes you collected? You kind of just left them there in the office. He might have had a, an arrest warrant out there hanging out for him, you know. So this was a very dangerous thing he did, but he did it anyway. And so he held a large reception at his home for Jesus. And a huge crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. This shows here that Levi was pretty wealthy, probably upper middle class. He had enough money to hold a large banquet at his house and invite a lot of his friends who were tax collectors. He didn't have friends <laughs> probably in other places. Even though he had abandoned his post already, he probably wasn't going to have another income. But he said, that's okay. I'm going to hold this feast in Jesus' honor. And he decides to invite all the people that he knew, his friends. And before long, we see that the whole place was filled. His whole house was filled probably with outcasts, as we're going to see later on. The Pharisees were there as well, and their scribes, and they complained to Jesus. They asked, why are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? So who were these Pharisees? They were one of the strictest sects of the Jewish religion. They were known as the people's party, politically speaking. And they sought to interpret everything according to the strictest sense of the law, Moses' law, that is which often included human viewpoints because they provided an interpretation often that was not really in the law. And so their interpretation of the law often led to a lot of traditions that they thought that they needed to follow. And so they forced other people to follow. And they said, well, if you're not following it, if you're not following the law the way we say you need to follow it, then you're not really a disciple of Moses. And so that's how they became very strict and uh, how they alienated many people, even calling other people, judging them. Oh, these sinners, these tax collectors, you know, they're nobody. And so they looked at Jesus and Jesus said that, you know, he was the son of God and he was claiming to be a rabbi and many other things. 
And so that invited a lot of criticism from the Pharisees. And this is one such occasion when they are criticizing Jesus. They were religious conservatives, you could say, at the time. How does Jesus answer? This is br brilliant. Jesus' answers are always brilliant. He answers them. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Those who are sick do. I've come to call sinners to change the way they think and act, not to call people who think they have God's approval. So Jesus informs them of his sacred perspective. He's not interested in those who think they are right. He can't really help those who think they are right in God's eyes. But those who want to be right and are honest enough with themselves and their flaws, those are the people that he can help. Those who recognize that they're sick. And we face that in our world today, right? Sometimes we may have a family member whom we know is sick, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally, but they don't think they're sick. They think they're fine. And we're like, well, you're really not. You should go see a doctor. And tell me how hard it is to bring them to a doctor, right? It's almost impossible to convince them that they need to go to a doctor. Well, this is the same principle Jesus is speaking of here. Some people just want to be right, and they don't want to humble themselves. Maybe they don't want to accept a reality. And so who can help them? No one really can help them. Not even you who are the closest family member are able to help them if they don't recognize their help. But those who want to be right need to eventually humble themselves to accept God's perspective and abandon their own. That's really the challenge we all face before the cross of Christ. Are we going to be honest enough with ourselves? Are we going to be humble enough to recognize that we need to see things from God's point of view and not just from our own? What we can learn from this statement that Christ is saying here is that the gospel is really for everybody. It doesn't matter who or what the person has done, as long as they recognize that, yeah, you know what? I need healing. Christ is able to provide that healing. He wants to provide it. He is the great physician, but he needs somebody who's honest about it. Somebody who really wants to get well. Just, I think it was Robert who preached a lesson not too long ago about the, the, the guy who didn't want to get well, who, who was paralyzed all those years. And Jesus is asking him, do you want to get well? Some people apparently don't want to get well. So they answer back. They said to him, John's disciples frequently fast and say prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But your disciples just eat and drink. You're always eating and drinking. <laughs> So, you know, they're powerful, they're stubborn, these Pharisees, very pride-filled. And all they can offer Jesus are complaints, complaints of what he should be doing or what he's not doing. They're always finding something wrong. Instead of wanting to be enlightened, instead of maybe learning something from the situation, when they're challenged in their way of thinking, no, they can't do that. You probably know some people like that, right, where... You know, you try to offer them something enlightening, but no, nope, all they are interested in is complaining and pointing out your faults. Jesus just didn't match their expectations. You know, here they thought, the Pharisees, you know, they were the great religious leaders, the people's party. And so when they're seeing somebody that doesn't match their expectations, they have to complain. And Jesus definitely did not match anyone's expectation. And let me tell you something, us Christians, we can be Christians for a long time, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And if you have a relationship with the resurrected Christ, he will never match your expectations. It's a constant journey of growth and learning. That's how you know you have a relationship with the creator of the world. People who say, oh yeah, I tried church. I tried Jesus, but he didn't work for me. Well, you, you tried something else. You tried some other idol. You tried some idolatrous situation here, but you cannot come close to the creator of the world and say that because look at the reaction people had in the New Testament, meeting him face to face. And now our interaction with him 
is on the other side of the cross. We're interacting with the resurrected Christ who is far above, more powerful, and he's constantly challenging our expectations. And it's a, it's a wonderful, it's an amazing journey. But <laughs> they were prejudiced, these Pharisees. They just wanted to find fault with him. Apparently during this reception that Jesus was having here at Levi's house, the Pharisees and the scribes were asking questions of regarding fasting. Somehow or another, this topic came up. And I think I know why. They wanted to know why were the disciples of John fasting and the Pharisees were fasting. Hey, you know, they were probably saying, we're very religious people. We're very seriously religious. Look, we fast twice a day or three times a week. And even John's disciple, you know, they're very serious religious people. Look at them fasting. But you and your disciples, all you do is eat and drink. It sounds like, it doesn't sound like you're religious to me. It doesn't look like you're serious about your relationship with God. So they were judging them based on appearance. Matthew 9.14 indicates that some of John's disciples were probably there at that feast and that they were probably being questioned as well. Why do you think they brought this up at this moment? I think it probably was because they saw Jesus having a good time. I think some people can't resist or can't take others enjoying themselves. <laughs> they have to find some kind of fault, <laughs> especially when you're a critical person. You just have to rain on somebody's parade. You can't be still until you pop all their balloons, until you rain on their parade, because that's who you are. That's how you like to engage other people. And it seems like they were that way. They couldn't get him on his association with sinners, so they tried to get him on another subject. They were just trying something there. And because they were having a great time, they knew Jesus went to a wedding feast and they had a great time. And you know, when we're eating, when we're at a barbecue, when we're at a picnic, we're just enjoying ourselves. We're having a great old time fellowshipping. But here come the buzz kills, you know, the mosquitoes, like Gerard was pointing out, trying to eat your food, <laughs> uh, party poopers, right? You know, the kind, so full of their own righteousness that they can't even enjoy themselves. Maybe some of you were like that before, trapped in some kind of religious ideology that was not true, you know, trapped in some kind of political ideology that prevents you from really enjoying the blessings that God has given you in your life. Many of us, I think, walk down that path. This is something to learn from Jesus, right? Not even these party poopers could kill his mood at the time with Matthew. But Jesus has a great comeback. And he illustrates this by telling us a few parables and by giving us a comparison. The first thing he asked them is, can you force wedding guests to fast while the groom is still with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. And at that time, they will fast. So here he's offering them an analogy to help them understand what this situation was. He's calling himself the bridegroom here, very subtly. And he's saying, look, I'm with them. I'm with my bridal party here and we're about we're celebrating a wedding that's going to take place so we're happy who would go to a wedding and say we're announcing a fast now during the reception and meanwhile all the food is there <laughs> be like uh wait a minute something's wrong here right it just doesn't jive and that's what the pharisees were doing he's trying to help them think look you guys aren't really thinking about this the right way. He's calling himself the bridegroom. And Jesus often used wedding and marriage analogies when speaking of his relationship with people and his relationship with God. Because marriage is something that God has given us that is partly physical, but it is very spiritual to a great degree. And it becomes a great example, a great situation for us to learn a lot about God and how he relates to us through our marriage with somebody else. It's a divine arrangement, really. It's a wonderful thing. So the Pharisees, they fasted twice a week. They did this. 
as a tradition, as a custom. But when you examine the law of Moses, there was really only one fast prescribed by the law. And it was done as part of the command to humble your souls on the day of atonement. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 31. Isaiah 58, verse 3 also mentions it. That's it. There was no other command in the, in the law to fast. Just that one day. But the Pharisees fasted twice a week. Who was more religious? Who thought that they were more religious? Hey, I fast twice a week. You only fast once a year. <laughs> I'm more serious than you are about religion. Somebody could easily think that, right? About anything, not just about fasting. You know, hey, if I give $200 every week as a contribution, but you only give a dollar, who's more serious about their relationship with God? I could claim I am, right? So I give more than you. Now we know that that's not true, <laughs> but this is, this is warped religious thinking. This is dead religious thinking because then it becomes about you and where is God in this? He's not there. And when you're in that state of mind, you become just like the Pharisee became. You are finding fault. That becomes your mission because you are so much better. And that's not religion at all. That's man-made religion. But that is not the kind of religion God is looking for. So Jesus responds by asking them that question. Why would wedding guests fast while the bridegroom was still with them? Why would they fast during the reception? Jesus is telling us something about fasting. And he's telling us something about religious things that we may do. He says that fasting should be done with a purpose, should be done for a reason, not just do it just for the sake of doing it. Not just because, oh, it's important to do it, so I'm just gonna do it more times than necessary. This is one of those times when the Pharisees' interpretation of the law isolated them from their relationship with God. Because they started judging others by their own interpretation and not really by God's law. You don't fast, Jesus is saying, during a joyous occasion. But if you are sad or if you are in mourning, then Jesus helps us understand that that is a purpose for fasting. Not too long ago, I did a bit of a lesson on fasting because we've done that in these last few years, we've had enough reasons to, to fast. And so we spoke about that and we understand that there needs to be a purpose for it. We don't just do it just to do it. He also used these illustrations. This is what God's word calls it. In your version, it might say he also used these other parables. So he, he gives us two other illustrations to drive the point home of his mission, of why he was there, of why he was eating with other, quote-unquote, sinners. Of course, the Pharisees didn't understand that they should have included themselves under the sinners category, but they didn't. They thought they were better, and God finds fault with that. They were finding fault with the people. God is finding fault with them. Do not judge. Otherwise, the way you judge people, that same judgment is going to be applied to you. Remember when we talked about judgment? So he says, no one tears a piece of cloth from a new coat to patch an old coat. Otherwise, the new cloth will tear the old. Besides, the patch from the new will not match the old. So this is a bit of a parable that Jesus is using here. You don't patch something old with something new. Nowadays, who patches? We just throw it away and buy a new one, right? But <laughs> unless you really like that coat or whatever it is that you have. And you're like, man, I don't want to get rid of it. Let me patch it. I remember when my mom patched my jeans because, you know, there was not that much other there. We didn't have enough money. We were stretched thin. So I had pairs of jeans with a few patches, five, six, or seven. And they typically were around the same areas that they needed to be patched, the knees especially, right? Uh, and sometimes what would happen if you 
patch, if you use a new piece of cloth to patch an old pair of jeans, and then you throw them in the wash, what happens? The new patch shrinks in the wash and it tears the jeans even further. So th there's a little bit of a life lesson there. You don't use something new to patch something old because they're also, they also won't match as Jesus says here. Some interpret this as Jesus comparing the Old Testament with the New Testament. The New Testament is new. It's something good. It is better. The Old Testament is fading away. It will be done away with. And we know the scriptures do say that. We don't want to hang onto the old when the new has come. Who wants to wear the old pair of jeans when the new shiny jeans are here? And now they sell new jeans that are, you know, ripped. <laughs> so, go figure, right? <laughs> The Pharisees were judging based on their opinion of the law. It wasn't even according to what the law was saying. They weren't even using the law correctly as Jesus was showing them to do. Jesus is also telling them that there is a new covenant now that he's bringing. It was not a covenant to be under the law. Not a covenant where we're going to be judging people by all these exacting ordinances and laws as they were used to doing. But it was a covenant of grace. That's the new garment. It's a covenant of grace that we're to welcome everybody. I'm here at this feast and I'm interacting with everybody. That's what Jesus was showing them by what he was doing. Whereas the Pharisees were coming and saying, oh, I'm not going to hang out with that person. Oh, can't get close to that person. Oh, can't get close to that person. And so we see both people interacting very differently with that crowd. Under this covenant of grace, we associate with everybody. We're here to bring the grace of God, the love of God unto people. It's not something we keep unto ourselves. All are welcome. Everyone has an opportunity to be healed by the great physician. He welcomes those who are humble and those who are penitent in their heart. He wants you to be part of his family. He's not exacting a judgment on you. He's not trying to isolate you. He says, come as you are, or don't come at all. Actually, there was a song in the 80s that said that same thing. So applied to the question they asked Jesus, eating and drinking <laughs> is the new norm in this new covenant, because it is a joyous thing to proclaim forgiveness of sins, isn't it? I mean, on a resurrection Sunday, how more joyous can it be when we know our Savior lives? We don't, we've never worshiped anybody who's dead, but we worship someone who is alive. God says, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. And so he tells us that Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, they're not dead. They are living. I am the God of the living. And that's probably why we enjoy fellowship so much. That's something that really struck me when I first started to come to the church. I mean, I'm Puerto Rican. I love eating and drinking already. You know, I love the family gatherings, especially in Christmas, with the roast pork going on on the spit, and the arroz con gandura y pastel, and all that other good stuff, man. You know, I was not, I was an antisocial when I was a little kid. I didn't do much interaction, but I liked the eating part. <laughs> so now when I meet this church and everybody wants me to eat hamburgers and hot dogs and they're inviting me to feast after feast, I was like, yo, this is my place. I'm, I'm good here. I'm a poor student. I don't have anything to eat. So I love to eat all these things. So that's a way, you know, and think about it. How, when we eat with somebody, when we sit down to eat with somebody, it's like there's something, a burden lifted off. You know, it's like a person becomes more willing to listen, more willing to interact. I've observed this phenomenon myself. You invite somebody who maybe, oh, you know, he's a little iffy. You know, he might not want to talk to you. But you say, hey, you know, come, let's, let's grab a cup of coffee. Oh, come on, let's go eat at Panera. Or let's go grab a sandwich at Wendy's. And all of a sudden, their eyes open up a little bit. They got a little bit of a pep in their step. Ooh, Wendy's, Popeye's, or whatever it is that they might like, you know? Or sometimes just a good home-cooked meal, you know? 
like my wife, I said, hey, my wife makes great arroz con gandure, pasteles, you know, we have some pernil, oh yeah, I'm there, I'm there already. And that's how you get a reaction from some people. Jesus knew that. And so he was trying to communicate that in this feast. This is the new norm. We're not trying to isolate people here. So it's about the eating and the drinking. I mean, hasn't even our very memorial about Jesus, isn't it about eating and drinking? Weren't we here today and every first day of the week eating to remember Jesus' flesh? Drinking to remember the blood, as Gerard even pointed out? Wow, that has become the new norm, hasn't it? In an incredible and very deep way. There is no connective power as the power and the joy that we feel when we're feasting joyously. Eating together is something also that binds us together. So much so that we even do it here to commemorate the Lord's rising, the Lord's death and his rising. The last supper that he had with his disciples. And we all have different relationship with food. Some of us a little healthier, some of, some of us not so healthy. <laughs> People have put so many taboos on food, haven't they? You know, we, we, instead of controlling ourselves, we control the food. We take the fat out of it. We take the sugar out of it because we can't control ourselves. So we might as well control the food. And so food has become an obsession for some people, something unhealthy. You think that that's God and God's intention? Or maybe that's the devil's intention. You know, if eating together is something very powerful that even Jesus had used, you tell me this craziness that we have as food. Is it healthy or is it not? I've even observed that in myself. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to try to control myself. And I'm not going to try to control God's food anymore. Because I'm going to enjoy my Popeye sandwich. You know? I'm going to enjoy a Dunkin' Donut. Not every day. That's the difference. Not every day. Once a month, I would say now my wife and I, maybe maybe on Valentine's Day, that's when we go to Dunkin' Donuts to get the heart-shaped donut. That's about it. Maybe once a year. You know, I, That's a healthy relationship, I think, right? Once a week, we go to Popeye's. But, you know, my wife cooks delicious, so sometimes we don't even feel like we have to go. We have to have a healthy relationship with it because it's going to become a pivotal thing to use in our evangelism with others. And, yeah, we're going to come across some that, oh, I'm allergic to this, I'm allergic to that, I can't have this. I can't. I'll, I'm, I'm one to say, hey, you know, I don't like eating milk. Because dairy, you know, messes with my lungs and stuff. And, you know, that's a legitimate thing, right? But other than that, I'm good to go with anything else you got for me. <laughs> Food and feasting. They have become something spiritual. They can become something spiritual. They can become something powerful when we know how to use it. It's like money. Some people have all kinds of unhealthy relationship with money. Sometimes they even let money control them. Sometimes they get in debt because they don't know how to control themselves. And yet money, all it is, it's a tool. It's a tool that God gives us. And it's a tool that we can use for evangelism. Same goes with food. And this has been happening since the times of Jesus. He used other analogies. He says, people don't pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the new wine will make the skins burst. The wine will run out and the skins will be ruined. Rather, new wine is to be poured into fresh skins. No one who has been drinking old wine wants new wine. He says, the old wine is better. What is he trying to say here? He switches analogies now. Now he's talking about wine. And wineskin, something very common. They knew that very well. They drank wine. There was no refrigerated water. There were no soft drinks. There were no freezers. You couldn't drink water. You might be poisoned because it was not fresh. So the only healthy thing to drink back then was either brand new grape juice, 
which typically didn't last long because what happens if you leave grape juice in a jar for too long? It ferments and it turns into either vinegar or wine, one or the other. <laughs> and typically that wine there, it has a lot of probiotics, has a little bit of alcohol, you know, so it's kept safe. It's safe to drink in an unrefrigerated situation. That's why that was the main drink of the day. Okay, that was the reason. And I'm not going to get into a whole lesson about wine here. That's not the point here. But new wine, which has yet to ferment, if it's poured into new wineskins, the fermentation process releases gases, typically carbon dioxide. So the new skins stretch out like that. That's how you knew that the process of fermentation was happening when you put the new wine into the wineskin. They would stretch and become really, really bloated like that. And then as they started to go down, then you know that the wine was starting to, to happen, <laughs> started to occur, right? And maybe it was ready to drink if that's what you wanted. If you poured new wine into an old wineskin, what do you think was gonna happen? The old wineskin was already uh, brittle. You know what happens to leather coats after a long time, right? I had this leather coat for a really, really long time. It started to become very brittle, almost like cardboard, it felt like. And then it started to rip just like cardboard. And that's what would happen with an old wineskin. As it started to you know, blow it up, it would just crack and then the wine would be spilt. And nobody wanted that. What does that mean? What do these analogies mean? Think about the new wine as the new covenant. Old wine as the old covenant. Jesus was saying, look, you can't handle this new wine. Because you've made yourselves out to be, this is what he's telling the Pharisees, old wineskins. You've been crippled by your interpretations. You've been made stiff by your ideologies. So if I'm trying to teach you a new thing, you're just going to break. <laughs> this new covenant of grace is going to break you. And you're just going to be broken. So Jesus is taking this new wine and putting it into the people who want to get healthy by God. Who understand where they're at and who want a relationship with God and want to listen and want to taste and enjoy this new wine of the new covenant. Those who don't see the value of what Jesus was teaching are threatened by it. And that's what the Pharisees were. Those who don't see the awesomeness of the grace of God, but are instead threatened by it, are like an old wineskin. They'll crack. They'll be torn. And so they cannot understand it. They cannot receive that new teaching. They can't comprehend it. They can't embrace the new wine. In saying this, Jesus is also responding that the things that were commanded by Moses in the law of Moses for them to do had a purpose, including fasting. That everything that God had commanded Moses and had given in the law of Moses and under the old covenant had a purpose. And that that purpose in Christ was fulfilled. That old wine ran its course. It accomplished its purpose. And now there was something new coming. And you had to get ready for it. You had to examine yourselves. You had to repent. You had to change the way you think and act. We see that constantly in God's word. That's how they translate repent. Change the way you think and act. Because that's what repent means. In order to embrace this newness, the grace of God, we had to change the way we think, the way we act. That's what, that's what Jesus' message and John's message even was, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. That was the message. But some just didn't want to. They wanted to hang on to the old. That's why he makes that comment. Oh, the old wine is better. Some people would say. When somebody says that, they have no understanding at all of what Jesus is bringing to the table. They're not ready. And so we all need to be very careful, even as Christians, even as people who want to embrace the new covenant, we need to be very careful about how we think of our traditions and how they might fit into this new wine, into the new covenant. 
Because in the church, the same problem sometimes happens today, as we see here the problems that the Pharisees were having. Sometimes there will be a tradition that somebody might have in the church, and they think that that tradition is God's law, or that's how God ordains it. And when they do that, immediately, you know what starts happening? They become critical. That's the first sign that you are out of bounds with God. You start becoming critical. Oh, they're doing this, but they're not doing that. They're doing that, but they're not doing this. And all of a sudden, instead of grace, you become like a Pharisee. That happens today still. And it always occurs because of somebody's interpretation. See, those who really want to follow the law of God, they understand that other people are not going to come to Christ if we're just nitpicking on certain things. They need to first know Christ and get to know him as Lord and Savior so that they can embrace his covenant, not the other way around. And that's what Jesus was doing there at the feast. They wanted to come. I said, they need to know who I am. They need to understand my grace. They need to understand who I am. And then they'll follow me to the ends of the earth. It's about a relationship that needs to be established. But if we're so focused on ourselves uh, instead of God, we won't have the capacity to do that, to show the love of God. You know, people are used to the same values they're raised with. It's hard to change your values sometimes, especially as we get older. Once we begin maturing, it's like that saying goes, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Although there are a few old dogs here that have been taught new tricks <laughs> and they're doing very well in Christ. Uh, <laughs> amen. <laughs> I, I'd like to think I'm one of those old dogs that can, that can change. Because you know what? When you're in Christ, you just need to. Because that new skin just keeps expanding. It doesn't stop. <laughs> and the moment you become critical, you know, you're going to get a tear in there. So Jesus, for Jesus to change the values of the world, it really would require divine intervention. And that's exactly what happened. That's the gospel. Divine intervention to change the values of the world. Jesus' point here as to how something the old wine is better is because many just seek the status quo, you know, or they want to go back. You know, we have this sense of nostalgia, right? That's big in our generation, right? Once we start hitting our 40s and our 50s, we get hit with this nostalgia. With, oh, the old days were better than the new days. And do you know that the Bible says that it's nonsense to talk that way? That it's foolishness to think that? Because the old days are really no different. <laughs> it's just our own interpretation. It's our nostalgia that kicks in and messes with our brain. That's not the Holy Spirit, by the way. But we say things like that. And some seek to be rebels or revolutionaries. You know, we're, let's fight the system. We don't see Jesus ever doing that. That's not, that was not his call. Because whatever we do in the power of Christ, in the body of Christ, is revolutionary enough. It's a grassroots movement. It always has been, and it will continue to be. The church has knocked down every other political system that mankind has come with for the last 2,000 years, and it will continue to do so. So if you want to be a revolutionary and a rebel, no better place than in Jesus' body, the church. Because <laughs> that's the nature of this dove. I was going to say the beast, but no, it's not a beast, it's a dove. Then when, we're, when we've bought into Jesus' way, we will be able to be social as Jesus is in this new welcoming way where we can welcome everyone and not be inclined to be prejudiced or cliquish. This is how the world will know that we are his disciples, as he says here. I'm giving you a new commandment, he says. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Everyone will know that you're my disciples because Women don't preach in the church. Is that what it says there? No. Everyone will know that you're my disciples 
Because you take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? No, that's not what it says there either. And you can try and fit there any little thing that people think is a defining thing. Jesus says, no, nope. what's going to define you is how you love one another. And that's why Paul said, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, one body, one spirit, one gospel, one hope, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Whether we are Jewish or Greek, slave or free, men or women. Democrat or Republican, vaccine or not vaccine, <laughs> God gave all of us one spirit to drink. He's the one that binds us all. And so this becomes the new and welcoming way. Jesus was offered as this lamb that we, that would take away the sins of the world, his sacrifice allowed God to change the testaments and usher in this new one, this new wine, based on grace, not the law, because Jesus fulfilled the law where we could not. We always came short of God's expectations. And God made it very clear to let us know. But he says, I'm going to give you my son, and he's going to fulfill everything. So now we have that opportunity to not be judged against some commandments, but to be offered grace on behalf of God. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. We decided to abandon God's teaching. We decided to think that we knew better than God. And so it is us who continue to trade God's glory for some tarnished glory or knickknack that the world tries to offer us. We're the ones constantly challenged in that way of thinking. But the gospel always reminds us of God's unlimited love and his perfect justice, all meshed into one. Sin had to be paid for. God didn't just forget about it. No, he says it has to be paid for. But it was paid for by his son, Jesus Christ. He offered himself up to it, which is why we worship him which is why we're called Christians and we follow him because we pay homage to him who allowed us now to become part of divinity where we could not have done that before. All we have to do is accept his unlimited grace in Jesus Christ. But we first need to acknowledge that we are very sick and that we need a great physician to heal us. We have to be open and honest about that and leave that self-righteous way of thinking off to the side so that we can become part of his body. As Paul says, be given of that one spirit to drink. And that all happens when we get baptized. We're united to Christ in a death like his by being baptized into him. That's how the Bible says we put on Christ. And just like Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day, as the world is celebrating today, we are raised to live in newness of life. We're still in this body. It's still a body that is prone to sin and prone to imperfection, but we don't live by the law anymore. We live by grace. Isn't that amazing? And so we can continue to walk confidently because we're walking in the light as Jesus walks in the light. We confess our sins. We're transparent. We understand who we are because we understand where God wants us to go. And we're on this journey of discovery of the blessings of God, of his unlimited love, Every single day for the Christian is the day that gets better until the day that we're taken away. Maybe my body won't feel better <laughs> as I move on, but in my inner man, I grow stronger and newer day by day. And that is the love that allows us now to welcome everybody into the body of Christ. Gone are the prejudices, the dividing lines. Love knows no lines. And that is the challenge that Jesus poses to us every Resurrection Sunday, which is every single Sunday. <laughs> I invite you to pray with us today. Let's pray together. Let's pray to continue to die to our flesh, to continue to put our hubris and our, and our self-righteousness away, to bury that, to die to that, because that's what's going to cause us to be divided. Let's pray that we can 
be disciples that enjoy the blessings of Christ, I invite you to come pray. What do you need to pray for? What is bugging you at the moment? What is it that's hindering you at your job or at your school from becoming the testimony of love that Jesus wants you to be? Maybe you need to pray about a way that you're showing some prejudice towards somebody at work or in your family somewhere. Let's pray about that. Let's give that to God. Surrender to the Spirit. If you've been baptized, surrender to Him. And if you have not been, then let's come. Come and pray with me. And let's pray for your heart to be open to receive the blessing of Christ so that you can get baptized and start living in newness today. May God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Okay, good afternoon, family and friends. Uh, John chapter 6 reads, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Family, I wanted to talk about mosquitoes briefly as we participate in the Lord's Supper. With the warmer temperatures beginning to start in Long Island, there is one guarantee that soon enough mosquitoes will restart their attack on us by biting us, sucking our blood. But before you squish that next mosquito, which is bound to land on you this spring, or summer season, I want us to think how similar we are to mosquitoes in our relationship to Jesus Christ. You know, mosquitoes are these annoying tiny insects that land in our much larger bodies, and their sole reason they land on us is to drink our blood. So you might be wondering, why do mosquitoes drink our blood? The answer is pretty straightforward. Mosquitoes must drink blood. It's a literal life or death situation. Blood is full of essential nutrients for mosquitoes, and they can't find this anywhere else or from any other source. Without consuming blood, the circle of life for mosquitoes would cease entirely. Wouldn't that be a blessing? <laughs> well, guess what, family? We are like mosquitoes. All of us have landed on a body that is so much greater, so much more powerful and bigger than our weak physical bodies that are destined to decay and die. All of us have landed in the body of Christ. You see, when we were immersed into Christ, we were placed into the biggest, most powerful body that exists, which is the body of Christ. And as Christians, we can proclaim that our Savior has the most powerful body, because as we just sang, after his body was brutally murdered on a cross, it was placed in a grave. But Christ arose. Jesus resurrected from the grave three days later, defeating death. And now that we have landed in Christ, we're all called to drink in the eternal, life-saving blood of Christ. Just as a mosquito would land on you or me, and suck in our blood from us in order to live and survive in a similar way we need to drink in this precious, pure blood of our Savior. Not only to survive, but to thrive and flourish in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Just like mosquitoes, we are in an eternal life or death situation and drinking in the blood of Christ. Remember, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. So as we partake of this Lord's Supper, let us be reminded what we have in Christ. We have eternal life only and solely by Christ sacrificing his body and pouring out his blood. So that we can eat of this unleavened bread and fruit of the vine represented here. And the scriptures go on to teach briefly that each person should examine oneself before eating of the Lord's Supper. Each one of us needs to look inwardly 
and think of God's patient love for all of us. You see, as humans, we are quick to squish an annoying mosquito feasting on our body. But our God is the complete opposite of us. Think of all the times while in Christ, we annoyed Christ while we sat on the body of Christ, drinking in this precious blood of Jesus, where God could have or should have easily squished us like an annoying mosquito. Think of all the times while we were in Christ, we had impure and sinful thoughts, or all the times we've been stubborn, self-righteous, prideful, arrogant, had ungodly, ungodly attitudes, broken promises, and at times outright sinful actions. And even though Christ had every reason to squish us and toss us out of his beautiful body, which is the church, our God did not squish us. Instead, our God showed us and continues to show us his abundant mercy, grace, and love by allowing us all to gather here and drink in his eternal life-sustaining blood. So family, let us be encouraged. We have another opportunity to remember our Lord, what he has done for us. And let us be reminded of God's complete, unfailing love provided in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's have a prayer. Our mighty God, uh, what a privilege it is to come before the God who spoke the world into existence. And when we think about uh, what you've done for us, uh, we think, Father, just how small we are into everything you've created, the universe and galaxies upon galaxies, and how, Father, you protect us, you watch over our lives. We thank you for saying the Christ. Uh, we just ask, God, as we partake of this bread, we remember the body that was given for us to give us hope and life beyond the grave. And we are so grateful and thankful for the resurrection. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us continue to pray. Sorry, let's wait a moment. Sorry about that. Let's continue to pray. Our Father and God, uh, what a privilege it is once again to come before you, remembering the blood of Jesus that washed us when we were immersed into the most powerful body, the body of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we just want to remember the blood that was poured out so lovingly, so willingly. And Father, we have everything. We have forgiveness of our sins. And you just call us now to look uh, inwardly and see how we can be more like you, more conformed to the likeness and image of your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you again for this precious and pure blood that gives us so much hope and uh, gives us so much joy knowing, God, we have great things in this life and the life to come. And we offer this prayer in your son's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears nor sorrow can be found. And I'll receive my mansion, robe and crown. Mansion, robe and a crown. There, love always. Abound. Let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion, robe and crown. The weather there is always fair. There's sunshine day and night. No cold and the rain will fall there, for the sun shines ever bright. I need no every garment. So I'll just wrap my robe around when I receive my mansion. Robe and crown, mansion, robe and a crown. There love always abound. 
let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion, robe and crown. I'm gonna trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears no sorrow can be found. And I'll receive my mansion, robe and crown. Mansion, robe and a crown. There love always abound. Let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion robe and crown. Amen.